Right, well, I'm not going to talk about sex differences, right? I'm only going to talk about women. So uh, I'm not sure I know how to move this on. That didn't move it on. There we are. Okay, so I'm going to teach you epidemiology 101. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So the, tr the trick here is that you need to stay down here, right? Now, it, that sounds ridiculous, but oh, no, no, that isn't ridiculous. That actually you can do, right? Well, we don't know how to do it for the colon, right? But I'll show you, we do know how to do it for most female cancers. Anyhow, this is the curve, the, and the curve, I'm mainly interested down here, and you can't see down here, so we put it on a log-log scale, where you can see that what's happening down here is the same as what's happening everywhere, right? So that's why we do this log-log plot, so we get the straight line. I learned this from Richard Dahl many, many years ago, and he learned it from Peter Armitage, and they learned it from the Norwegians. In fact, everybody who knows anything knows about this. Uh, right, now you can see this curve doesn't look like that. Because this curve is in women, and something magic happens here, and that's menopause, right? So if you had menopause down here, you wouldn't get this cancer, and that's actually true, right? So the idea is, how can you have menopause when you're 20 and not notice it, right? There's a very important concept about that you can change things because things are changed. If you have an oophorectomy at 20, that's what will happen. Okay. So in, in, the, in the early 90s, late 80s, Henderson and I and Ron Ross and others actually decided that in fact we were working with Bruce Ames and some other people that in fact what was really going on was cell proliferation was the problem. And that you shouldn't measure time in years, you should measure time in how much proliferation has gone on in that tissue. And in fact, there was a recent paper by Thomas Setti and Vogelstein, which of those of you who don't know this paper should go and read it because it's completely fascinating. It might even be wrong, but it's fascinating. <laughs> Here's their paper and it says here, yeah, what are the total number of stem cell divisions and how much cancer do you get? And they get this fabulous picture. Well, of course, I like it and I'm not going to be critical of it because it fits exactly with what I believe, right? So it's not how old you are, it's how long you've lived. And how long you've lived depends on how busy you are. Okay. So we'll deal first of all with the one cancer that we know most about, which is endometrial cancer. We know most about endometrial cancer because it's on the outside of the body, right? It's very hard to study the ovary, the breast, but the endometrium gynecologists are always looking, right? So we know an awful lot about this. So the person who really sorted it out was Ferenczi in uh, Montreal. He published this paper many, many years ago and he showed that in fact, Proliferation rates in the endometrium were high and pretty uniform until just a few days after ovulation when proliferation rate in the endometrium dropped to zero, right? And this is what's happening with estrogen and this is what's happening in progesterone and this is a progesterone effect. Okay, so here's all the epidemiology we know, right? Don't have a late age at menopause, don't get fat, have lots of babies. Don't use menopausal estrogen therapy. Use, it's okay to use estrogen progestin replacement therapy as long as you give progestins all the time, right? And OCs are wonderful. All of those are explained by that previous figure because all of these are just, the things that protect you are things that stop cell division and the things that are bad for you cause cell division. It's as simple as that. Why do oral contraceptives prevent it? Because oral contraceptives look like this. There's lots of progesterone around and it's a progestin dominant feature as far as the endometrium is concerned. So there's no cell proliferation in the endometrium when you're on the pill. So instead of just being the short period here, it actually extends for almost the whole time. 
right? There's a little bit. If you took the pill every day, then it would really work. Right? So why don't we take the pill every day? It's because of the Pope, right? Because in Boston, when they were developing the pill, they thought that if you just let women have a withdrawal bleed, which they'd continue to call a menstrual cycle, but it's just a withdrawal bleed, then the Catholic Church would actually okay it that this was a form of contraception that was natural. Well, it didn't work. But by that time, everybody had decided that three weeks on and one week off, which is what the pill is, is the right thing. And women like it in a way, or so they tell me, because they know they're not pregnant because they have a withdrawal bleed, which I think is a lot of nonsense, but... Okay. Now, is the effect big? The effect is huge. But if you took the pill for 15 years, your risk is reduced by 80%. Now, is that a long time? Oh, well, I've got lots of daughters, right, who don't tell me anything. And I don't want to know, but I do know that they had menarche at 12, right? They are sexually active until 12 to 50. Jesus, that's 38 years. Well, I hope they didn't start that early, but, <laughs> right? But at least 30 years. So this is nothing. This is nothing. Okay, so let's try to understand something about this. Here's a woman who hasn't, she has no babies, she's age 30. She, in fact, her endometrium has been proliferating for 17 years. When she goes on the pill, well, because when you're on the pill, you're not switched off completely. I'm going to say you're switched off half the time. In other words, you've doubled the amount of time that you're switched off compared to normal cycling. So, in fact, instead of being 17 years old, you're really only 14 and a half years old. That doesn't sound like much, 14 and a half divided by 17. That's only a 15% decrease. That can't make much difference. Ah, well, that's because you didn't pay attention when I did the log-log plot. That doesn't have a slope of one. It has a slope of six. So the change in incidence is a 61% change in incidence by taking the pill for five years. Right. The effects are huge. Right. Now, when she's 40, the risk is not reduced so much. Why is that? Well, people say the effect wears off. It's not that the effect wears off. It's that, in fact, the, the two and a half years that she's younger is now compared to 27, and that's a smaller change. So it goes down simply because of that reason. There's nothing mysterious about it. Okay. And when she's 50, it'll go down again. And so when you read papers and they tell you what the relative risks are, you have to ask how old the people were. If you do a study in 35-year-olds, the risks the prevention will look much bigger than if you do it in 60-year-olds, even though, in fact, the prevention effect is identical. People don't usually realize this. They talk about the effect wearing off. It doesn't wear off as you just get older. Okay. Now, here's what's so exciting about what's going on. There's enormous change in contraception. At the moment, the standard oral contraceptive has 21 active pills and seven placebo pills. That's been around since 1960. But recently, people realized that American women still got pregnant when they were on the pill, whereas German women did not. Well, there's nothing different. Most Americans, a huge number of Americans are from German extraction. So what the hell's happening? Well, there are more disciplines. So when they are supposed to take the pill at 8 o'clock tonight, they take it. An American woman, forget. Right, so what they showed was that if instead of doing 27, 21, 7, you do 24, 4, you turn Americans into Germans. <laughs> right? They now no longer get pregnant. So this is all the, 
all the new pills, it's the same pill. There's nothing different about the pill. That's what they've done. Is that going to make a huge difference? I'll show you in a minute. Right? And then this pill came out. Now, I invented this pill, uh, but I didn't patent it and anything. And in fact, people decided at East Virginia that this was actually a good idea. That you just have four periods a year, four withdrawal periods a year. This is three months on, one week off. Three months on, one week off. And if you do this, this is a very popular pill. It's the same pill. Now, when they tried this to give you 51 weeks on and one week off, women wouldn't take it. So that pill sort of came in the market and died immediately. OK, so here's another hormonal contraceptive, which I think is the most exciting thing that's happening, is Mirena. Now, Mirenas are IUDs, the intrauterine devices that hold the same progestin, levonorgestrel, at very, very low doses. And one, he has another one that's actually even lower. OK, so this is where we are. This is, this is Mirena over years. It lasts for years, five to seven to eight years. And the level of steroid in here, in your blood, is 10% of what it is in the pill. It's extremely low. And it was, this pill never got on the market. This pill is now on the market. It's called Skylar. And you can see that Skylar is like 3% of the dose. It's 3% of the dose. So if, in fact, there's a dose response anywhere, this is going to be very important. But this dose is completely enough to switch off the endometrium. Okay. So this is what happens if you use a Mirena, right? For five years, you get already get a 60% reduction, even at age 50, which means that in fact, effectively forever. Five years from 20 to 25 or 25 to 30, you'll cut your risk 60% for the rest of your life. This is a remarkable finding, right? So there must be something the matter with that, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. Okay. Now, this is one of the, so I, one of the things I said in the title was I would tell you things we don't understand, right? And this is one thing that I've known about for quite some time. We worked this out with Wendy Seti, one at USC, which is that if, in fact, you have a baby late, like you know, all those educated women, they just, like my daughters, they have their babies in their late 30s, right, or early 40s. You get, if you have a baby in your late, in your late 30s, you, your, your risk of cancer in medium is drastically reduced, much more than if you had it earlier. Now, what's going on here? I don't have a clue. I think it's because you actually slough them off, right? The people don't really understand what the status is of the endometrium after birth. Effectively, I think you get rid of a lot of tumors at that stage. No one is working on that. I think this is something that pathologists could sort out for us. So we are trying to sort it out by seeing whether, in fact, Mirena will do this, right? Because Mirena is a huge dose of progestin in the endometrium. It may be the same as having a, as having a baby. And if that's true, that 60% reduction we would have before will be even bigger. Okay. All right, so we started about that because we know so much about cancer of the endometrium. Cancer of the ovary looks exactly the same. And we didn't really understand much about this for a long, long time. Oh, we thought we understood about it, but we didn't. Right, okay. First of all, this was the first thing that people found out. Having babies, fabulous. Have five babies, your reduction is reduced by almost 50% for the rest of your life, right? Okay. Uh, what was supposed to happen? Well, what's supposed to happen was that you ovulated 
and you made a rip in the surface. And then the bit of the surface got trapped inside, got stimulated by all the high steroid levels inside and became cancerous. That was the idea generated by this remarkable Egyptian fatale who was at WHO. And he called this that the reason for getting cancer of the ovary is incessant ovulation, right? He said, my God, you want to have three children, you have to ovulate for 35 years? That's ridiculous, right? All right, so now what happens? Well, it's the same thing. So if you go through the same sort of arithmetic for this, only that curve doesn't go up at the sixth power, the curve only goes up at the fourth power, you still get this. For five babies, your reduction in risk is about 50%, very much like what epidemiologists found. So we know we're in the right game. Okay. Now, oral contraceptives are only half as good. And we didn't really understand how important that was. That says to us that the theory that it's ovulation is nonsense because you don't ovulate on the pill either. So this should be identical to having a baby, but it's not. And so we finally began to understand this. Not epidemiologists didn't understand this. Pathologists understood it. What did they do? They took BRCA1 women who we know are going to get, have a high risk of cancer of the ovary, and they cut their ovary up in the 90s in Toronto, and they were going to look for early lesions. And when they sliced the ovary up in minute detail, they couldn't find any early lesions. But they luckily decided to look in the fallopian tube, and when they cut the fallopian tube up, there the lesions were. Now, why did they cut up the fallopian tube? Ha! Huh. Because cancer of the ovary always looked like the fallopian tube. And people just weren't paying attention, except my colleague Louis Dubow in, at USC, who wrote a fabulous paper in 1999, and he said, cancer of the ovary, the emperor has no clothes. It can't possibly be this ovulation. It must be something different, because it looks like the fallopian tube. It probably is the damn fallopian tube. Well, anyhow, we now know that that's almost certainly true. Now, so what's going on? What's driving the fallopian tube? Well, a number of studies showed early on what was driving the fallopian tube. It's estrogen replacement therapy. This is for women who are taking Premarin, right? Or in Scandinavia, Estradiol or Estradiol Valerate. They get more cancer of the ovary. And in some studies, not all, for reasons I don't understand, if you add a progestin to this, it doesn't happen. Now, the, who studied this? You want to do studies where no one's working. This is the place. This is the place. And I'll show you that in a minute, right? So here they are. No, I've already told you that. Right. This paper, Donez, I met him the other week. Fabulous guy. He's not as old as me, but close. Right. So he wrote this paper in 1985. He's the professor of obstetrics in Belgium. And he actually studied cell proliferation in the fallopian tube and showed it was exactly the same as the endometrium, that you proliferate until ovulation, and then it rapidly drops to nothing. Uh, George in Toronto showed that this is true in 2012. We have lots of data now showing it's the same. You get this drastic, now you know why the pill works. It works for the same reason it works in the endometrium. It switches the fallopian tube off. Right. Okay. Now, how can you explain the low ovarian cancer rates in Japan? Well, we can't yet. But in fact, if the fallopian tube fimbria proliferation depends on the serum estradiol levels, which we don't know about, then they, at the time those studies were done in Japan, 
the actual levels in the in that that in Japanese women had were probably at least 25% lower. So this might explain all the things we didn't really understand at that time. Right. Now here is the same thing, right? If you if we go back to having 21.7, 24.4, 84.7, they, it just gets more and more protective, right? What about a marina? Ah, now you don't know whether it's going to work, right? Because now you have this enormous dose of progestin right inside the uterus. How do you know whether it gets into the fallopian tube to switch it off? Okay. Well, again, there's only... The world's literature is negligible, right? You would think that uh, 100 million women took the pill this morning. You'd think there'd be an enormous amount of work going on in it. There's almost none, right? This guy, Nilsson, showed in 1982 that if you were on a Mirena, a slightly higher dose, a Mirena has 20 micrograms per day of levon or gestural, but he compared a 30 microgram intrauterine device against oral levon or gestural at a dose that's very common in the pill. And he showed that the concentration of levon or gestural in the fallopian tube was identical. So despite the fact that the level in the serum is only 10%, the level in the fallopian tube is identical. So there must be leakage from the endometrium into the fallopian tube. Right, and here now, this is some of you want to do studies. Here's the place to do studies. There's a Finnish cohort study of Mirena, where Mirena was used for the treatment of menorrhagia. The ovarian standardized insulin ratio was 0.6, so 40% lower. There were observed 59 cases, expected 99, but it's on national rates. They didn't interview anybody, so this is a very weak study. But endometrium, they found the same, which we know is roughly going to be true, right? And this is one paper from this person, Soini. I don't know whether it's a man or a woman. Uh, and what else? That's the only study there is. There are no studies. Well, you can't study it here yet because we haven't used it long enough. But Scandinavia is using it a lot, right? So you can imagine over the next few years we're going to find out. But we also know that we don't really understand the dose that you need of a progestin to actually have an effect. So Mirena's in single arm studies, no competitive studies. Mirena is very effective treatment of endometriosis. So that would suggest that despite the fact that the hormone level was only 10% of what it is in the pill, that's enough to control cell proliferation in endometriotic lesions. Is that true? We don't know. We're going to find out, right? We need to do randomized studies here soon to see whether this is going to prove. And now, what's the effect on breast cancer? Well, you say, well, the level in the serum is so low, it can't matter. Ha, we don't know. And I'll show you later about how much we don't know. Okay. So the studies I'm doing at the present at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we are actually looking, we're taking women who are having risk reduction bilateral oophorectomies, we're putting them on Mirena's for two weeks before they have the operation, and then we're going to look and see what's happening in the fallopian tube. That study is just about to take off. And at USC and at the University of British Columbia, we're actually putting people on the pill for a couple of weeks before they're operated on, so we'll see what's actually happening in the fallopian tube. Now, but this is the big thing that's happening, is that people have decided you want to prevent cancer of the ovary. Replace tubal ligation by taking the fallopian tube out. Now, that's not very commonly done yet, but in British Columbia, it's already done. 75% of tubal ligations are accompanied by removing the fallopian tube. In Toronto, it changed from less than 5% to 25% in the last 24 months. So there's this huge decision that this is going to really do it, 
why don't you just remove the organ? Ah, okay, does it work? Well, there are not very many studies. The first study was from the Mayo Clinic because there was one surgeon there who had been doing this for years. Right? Everybody else did uh, tubules, and this one surgeon took the fallopian tubes out so they could compare what was going on. And they showed here that, in fact, if you had a bilateral salpingectomy or just took the fimbria out where most of the fallopian tube is, then, in fact, the relative risk is 0.22, but it's based on one case and, like, eight control. It's based on nothing, right? There's virtually no data. But there's two studies done, one in Sweden and one in Denmark, using database studies. And both of them found an effect not as big as that at all, but in fact, they did find that. And so that we are going to know over the next two or three years, we'll know just how effective this is. OK. Is this a good idea? Ah, well, that's not so obvious. Right, so I, my wife's a professor of obstetrics at Columbia, and what she, uh, so she let me speak to the people doing tubal ligations at Columbia, and they won't do it, because they believe that in fact you're going to cause early menopause. So what's the data on that? Well, you would think we would know, not about this, but you would think we would know, do women who have a hysterectomy have an early menopause? There are lots of papers. They're all hopeless. And some of them appear to show that you might have menopause five years earlier. If that is true, that's a disaster. Because that's very bad for heart disease and lots of other things. How do you do such a study? It's very hard because you can't tell when she's menopausal. You have to ask her whether she feels menopausal. Well, you know, I feel menopausal some days, and I don't feel another. There's nothing to do with menopausal. It's how I feel, right? Well, you can do this, but you have to do this cross-sectionally. So you take women who are 48 years of age, right, and you ask them whether they had a hysterectomy or not and then you measure anti-Mullerian hormone, which tells you whether you're postmenopausal. Has such a study been done? No. Are we going to do it? We're actually doing it right now. Because this, if this is true, this would show that if you damage the arteries that supply the ovary, that could be a really bad idea. Now, it may be if you're a wonderful, oh, what happens with tubules? It's not known, right? What we do know is that women who have tubules have more hysterectomies. The, the whole business about what's actually the real results of having tubules, not in terms of cancer, but in terms of ovarian function, is extremely poorly understood. This is very much we need to work this out, and we need to work this out quickly. Because, in fact, how many women have a tumor in America? A third of all. In Denmark, it's 2%. In here, it's 30%. It's, a, it's one of the biggest operations there are. Right? It's the biggest form of contraception in the United States. And if we're going to replace it with salpingectomy, we'd better make sure we're not screwing everything up. We don't want to wait and epidemiologists find out years later. We need to find out now. OK. Well, I'm going to end off my favorite, of course, is how can we use this information to prevent breast cancer? Right? The pill doesn't prevent breast cancer. Well, that's not the most mysterious thing about the pill. Oh, we know why the pill doesn't protect it. It's because the pill is not the endometrium, and it's not the fallopian tube. It's the breast, and the breast is different. The breast proliferates in the second half of the menstrual cycle, only half as much in the first half. So here now, progestins do not block the action of estrogens. They augment them. OK, so that's easy. We must, there must be pills out there that are better than other pills, right? 
So I randomized women to giving them the same estrogen dose, ethanol estradiol, 35 micrograms, standard pill, one milligram of norethestrone, standard progestin. And I, that was the one arm. The other arm, I reduced the dose of progestin by 60%. Why did I do that? Because that's on the market, right? It's called Ovcon 35, and it has 60% lower. And what happened to proliferation? It got worse. It got worse because progestins control their own receptors. And when you reduce the dose from one milligram to 0.4, you more than doubled progesterone receptor. Not only do that, you doubled estrogen receptor. So you would achieve nothing. And in fact, the data is not efficient good to be sure about this, but it looks like that pill might actually be worse. So what's going to be happen? What's going to happen now if, in fact, you replace that with 10% with a Mirena or 3% with a Skylar? Well, of course, we don't know. We just don't know. But if, in fact, you could, there was some dose response, we should be able to sort this out. Now, it may be that it's not true for norethisterone, but it is true for MPA. Now, most people don't know this about the Women's Health Initiative, right? But the Women's Health Initiative, they gave you 0.625 milligrams of Premarin and 2.5 milligrams of MPA. That was a very strange thing to do because when you gave progestins for only 10 days a month, you didn't give it at 2.5 milligrams. You gave it at 10 milligrams. And in fact, the epidemiology shows you that in fact giving it 10 milligrams for 10 days was worse than giving 2.5 milligrams for 28 days. Now, that could be lots of reasons. But no, no, luckily the Scandinavians, usually smarter than we are, they never used medroxyprogesterone acetate. They used norethisterone acetate. And when they went from 10 days a month to every day, they didn't change the dose. And when they did that, things were much worse. So we know that duration matters, right? So it looks like MPA may be different from norethisterone. Do we know this? No. We don't have the slightest idea. MPA is not used in contraception, but that's something that we really need to find out. But if, in fact, there was some hope in this, then you could actually develop a pill that would really work because you need to switch. See, when you're on a marina alone, by the way, you still ovulate most of the time. And now, for that first two weeks of the month, when you are only exposed to your own estrogen and no progesterone, now I'm also exposing you to levonorgestrel. That's not a smart thing to do, right? We don't really know what's going on here. But as you can see with endometrium and ovary, that if you can interfere with proliferation in some constructive way, you can achieve enormous effects. Anyhow, I want you all to start working on this, right? Because I'm too old to work on it anymore. You need biologists, and you need to take biopsies, right? Stop doing questionnaires. Stick needles in and find out what's going on. You know, if you're to stick needles in men, they're hopeless. But women, they'll do anything, right? They are really smarter than them. And they will do this. And if we're ever going to actually prevent breast cancer, this is the way to do it. This way will work because you no know question about it. If you reduce the dose of estrogen and progesterone enough, you can achieve this. And I would hope that, in fact, I'll look down on you from somewhere or up at you from somewhere. And I know that in the next 10 or so years, we should undoubtedly be able to control all of these cancers. And that's a very, very exciting thing for me. I've been working on this. I've the first paper we published, 1979, where we actually were completely fascinated with Fatala about incessant ovulation. 
And uh, it's now, it's only, what is that, 35 years later, I think we're almost there now. And thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you. No, that's quite true. So, in fact, in this, we are doing studies at the moment. For example, one way you might think that this, that you might be able to affect things is by not using a progestin, but to use an anti-progestin. So, we have a study that's starting now at uh, Columbia using an anti-progestin called ulipristol acetate. Uh, it's just like RU486, but RU486 has a bad name, so you can't use that. But, do, but uh, David Baird in Edinburgh showed some time ago that, in fact, uh, uh, mifepristone is a very effective contraceptive. It changes the endometrial stroma in such a way you do not get massive uh, proliferation in the endometrium, which is what I was afraid of and that in fact you should really have a dramatic effect on the breast. So there what we're doing is, I, I, I would never have thought you could do it, but my wife's an incredible investigator and sh we now take two biopsies. We use this woman as her own control to try to control all those other things, right? You know, either got to do randomized studies and hope that, that that will take care of things, but with these studies where you're really not doing a lot of people, it's better if you can use the person as their own control. Right. Of course, there's, you know, there's huge differences between different women about the way they absorb the pill and all sorts of things, which, by the way, we have almost no understanding of whatever. Well, if I don't see other questions, I'd like to ask you, in that we are talking about sex differences, how does any of this relate to testes and some of the male oh. hormones? Okay, well, you know, when, when, we, when I was, the person who was mainly in charge of this in LA was Ron Ross and Brian, and we were, we were mainly interested in prostate, right? And so we were trying to show that, in fact, that steroid levels, that testosterone levels and so on was really the controlling factor in all these things. It just doesn't seem, to, it, it never worked out as well as this, so I don't, I've not done enough about it to know, but you know, you would, you would assume that something like that is going on, but it's, uh, it's not known. So I just said, why don't you stick needles in and find out? <laughs> but in fact, we know much more about women's breasts than we, knew, you know, we know about the prostate, and that really is nonsense, it's ridiculous. You know, I think people are really afraid to stick needles in, but it's, you know, I think that the, the group in Kansas stick needles in, I stick needles in, uh, it, you, you can do it, you know, and the prize is huge. You know, it's remarkable to me that, never mind 100 million women in the world who took the pill this morning, 10 million women in the United States took the pill this morning. So, you know, asking, to sort this out is not, it sh it, women will play, you can, I mean, the studies where a lot of these studies can be done easily in bracket one and two women, because they don't, you know, they don't want their daughters to get these things. Uh, and so, you know, I had a lot of trouble at Memorial getting them to actually do the study I'm now doing in Vancouver, which is to give a woman a pill before she has ovaries out, because I can see what's going on in the fallopian tube on the pill. And Memorial just said, oh, no, no, you'll cause deep vein thrombosis. Well, that is true. But you've just got to do studies that are very, very careful. No factor V Leiden, no factor two genes, very low D-dimer levels. You've just got to do things very, very carefully right, to make them ethical. One more question. So, What, when, yes, it does. <laughs> when, when you do the biopsy, do you distinguish which of the cells that, that are actually dividing? I don't know much about the breast, but I know a lot about the colon. And there, in any tissue like that, you've got a stem cell of the tissue. And what really matters is only the turnover of the stem cell. Oh, 
So you've got to know, in the case whether it's the breast or the intermediate, anything else, whether what you're looking at is the turnover of the stem cell or some progenitor turnover, which well, is almost irrelevant. Okay, so this is hard, right? <laughs> All right, so in fact, we don't do this. The group in Vancouver are trying to do this now with a fallopian tube, right? By, tr by trying to actually mark what's going on in the, in the stem cells. There is no work in the breast, right? The breast is simply saying, if you look at a terminal duct lobular unit and look at the cells that are on the inside, that's what we count. Now, in the fallopian tube, there's a lot of work going on in Vancouver about m marking, doing multiple stains so you can actually look at what the thing. I've always believed that if, this, if, the, if the organ is multiplying a lot, the stem cells must be multiplying, but that's just guesswork, right? I don't know. So you can work this out. <laughs> no, we need, huh? We, you know, but we need, right, we need people to work this out for it. So when the, you know, when the Melbourne people started to find things in the mouse and so on, oh, great, now we're going to, we have lots of samples, by the way. That's not the problem. I have hundreds of samples. We just don't know. And remember when I put up the thing from Vogelstein and that? That's all their notion about stem cells. I mean, that is a remarkable paper. I'm sure it's riddled with problems. Yes, <laughs> but it's an interesting notion that he's trying to do this, so I'm hoping that other people will fix that up. Anyhow, yeah, enough. Well, thank you so much. That was a very okay. stimulating talk. <laughs> and I think that I can do the introduction to our next